let me tell you what you're not going to hear. You won't hear me go on about the legacy, expectations, and the fanbase of Final Fantasy VII. You won't hear me constantly talk about how this game compares to the original. Nor will I talk to you like I'm assuming you've already played a 23-year-old game. Hi, I'm Oni Black Mage, and today I'll be reviewing Final Fantasy VII Remake. Short version, the game's fantastic. I recommend it, the wait was worth it. Okay, review's over. Please leave a like on the way out. Alright. Now that I'm done justifying biases, let's actually talk about the game. First off, to remake something by definition is simply to revisit or redo something again. Whether that is more specifically with the intent to reboot, retcon, or reimagine an IP is a different discussion that we're not going to have here. Before we talk about the game, I feel we need to take a quick step back and point out the playbook Square Enix has been using for most of the flagship Final Fantasy games for the past 20 years, because some people don't know and it bears mentioning. I find that if you put it under that lens in context, then this becomes a lot easier to review. This will be a long example, but bear with me, there is a point. Let's go back to definitely 12, but arguably Final Fantasy X. So, what was the main framework of Final Fantasy X? Well, it's a visually impressive fantasy based on reality, with a plot premise based on rebelling against the world controlling religious or political power. Players visit towns and sections of cities that are meant to be admired from a distance because there is little to no tangible interactivity with the world or NPCs in it. Side quests are superficial and mainly shallow reasons for combat. The main story ends with the final conflict, yet the main story is still incomplete, and so additional supplements are made. However, due to amazing production values, excellent soundtrack, frequent cutscenes and scripted sequences, immersive atmosphere, great character writing and voice acting, fun side activities and engaging combat, most of that is forgiven. Well, what did they do for Final Fantasy XII? Well, it's a visually impressive fantasy based on reality, with a plot premise based on rebelling against the world controlling religious or political power. Players visit towns and sections of cities that are meant to be admired from a distance because there is little to no tangible interactivity with the world or NPCs in it. Side quests are superficial and mainly shallow reasons for combat. The main story ends with the final conflict, yet the main story is still incomplete, and so additional supplements are made. However, due to amazing production values, excellent soundtrack, frequent cutscenes and scripted sequences, immersive atmosphere, great character writing and voice acting, fun side activities and engaging combat, most of that is forgiven. So what did they do for Final Fantasy XIII? Well, it's a visually impressive fantasy based on reality, with a plot premise based on rebelling against the world controlling religious or political power. Players visit towns and sections of cities that are meant to be admired from a distance because there is little to no tangible interactivity with the world or NPCs in it. Side quests are superficial and mainly shallow reasons for combat. The main story ends with the final conflict, yet the main story is still incomplete, and so additional supplements are made. However, due to amazing production values, excellent soundtrack, frequent cutscenes and scripted sequences, immersive atmosphere, great character writing and voice acting, fun side activities and engaging combat, most of that is forgiven. Final Fantasy Type-0 Well, it's a visually impressive fantasy based on reality, with a plot premise based on rebelling against the world controlling religious or political power. Players visit towns and sections of cities that are meant to be admired from a distance because there is little to no tangible interactivity with the world or NPCs in it. Side quests are superficial and mainly shallow reasons for combat. The main story ends with the final conflict, yet the main story is still incomplete, and so additional supplements are made. However, due to amazing production values, excellent soundtrack, frequent cutscenes and scripted sequences, immersive atmosphere, great character writing and voice acting, fun side activities and engaging combat, most of that is forgiven. Is there an echo in here? Final Fantasy XV? Well, it's a visually impressive fantasy based on reality, with a plot premise based on rebelling against the world controlling religious or political power. Players visit towns and sections of cities that are meant to be admired from a distance because there is little to no tangible interactivity with the world or NPCs in it. Side quests are superficial and mainly shallow reasons for combat. The main story ends with the final conflict, yet the main story is still incomplete, and so additional supplements are made. However, due to amazing production values, excellent soundtrack, frequent cutscenes and scripted sequences, immersive atmosphere, great character writing and voice acting, fun side activities and engaging combat, most of that is forgiven. So what's my point? Is this bad? No, not at all. These are all great games and the formula clearly works. They know from experience what to focus on and what not to focus on. My point is that this is not a new game to review, but the next stage of a well-oiled machine based on that blueprint. Now. Let's begin the review. For story, the game features a mercenary named Cloud, as he is hired to assist a terrorist splinter cell leader named Barrett, alongside childhood friend and martial artist Tifa, and later encounters a girl with mysterious powers named Aerith, and a captured canine used for experiments called Red 13. 
The game progresses along 18 chapters, and each one is set in a specific zone of interest before being capped in a grand boss battle. The entirety of the game takes place in the industrial city of Midgar, which is controlled and supported by the Shinra Electric Power Company. Barret's group is a small but extreme cell of the group Avalanche, and as they fight their battle against Shinra for the sake of the planet, a deeper web of plots unfold. Outside of combat, dialogue and interaction is a large focus of this game, as in every chapter, Cloud is mainly talking to a large and diverse cast of supporting characters, many of whom have their own stories to tell. Seeing how their distinct personalities play off of Cloud allow both characters to shine, as many minor characters become as memorable or likable as major ones, and Cloud's interpersonal relationships are developed in a natural and believable manner. The evolving banter between the main cast creates distinct bonds between each of them, as conversations usually feel organic, responses are logical, passions are portrayed, and no one's personality seems one-dimensional. There is a charming amount of humor and self-aware sarcasm too, which brings appreciated levity to interrupt the drama. With only a few exceptions, I felt every voice actor did a fantastic job delivering their performances, including the minor characters. Even hearing passerby remarks of NPCs as you pass them are numerous, well thought out, and well delivered. As if one returns to an area after some time, conversations and lines change to reflect recent events. I also want to specifically note how well children are written in this game, as so often I see many stories lazily write children as smaller adults, and here it sounds so authentic. My favorite dialogue is in the arena, where even the announcer will have some unique commentary on the limit breaks or summons I use. Environments are well detailed and set the appropriate moods immediately, from the humble slums to the dark reactors to the well-polished corporate HQ. Getting a closer look at many environments or backdrops do show a sharp drop in detail, as the pop-in for textures is frequent alongside the noticeable short draw distances in populated areas. Visuals, especially lighting and particle effects, are otherwise spectacular, though when it comes to NPCs, it's very distracting when your highly detailed and expressive main characters are talking to a low-detail, expressionless character who doesn't even have a name. Music is hit or miss, but usually hits, and every section has at least a few tracks layered on each other that fade in or out based on the context of location or battle. The amount of musical tracks and stylings in this game is impressive, and while this collection has quality and has quantity, not all of the quantity is quality. Still, when the music hits its highs, it hits very high. For side activities, there are 26 main quests, each pretty easy to find on the map and simple in structure. Unfortunately, nearly all of them are either go here and kill a thing, go here and talk to a guy, or find X many of Y object. While RPG quests in general do boil down to those structures, the problem is here there is no boiling needed. The game doesn't put forth large effort to add more context beyond the direct objective, but doing the side quests improves bonds with specific party members, which alter how later scenes and interactions play out, so they are worth doing beyond their base rewards. The best ones were the ones tied to a handful of delightful minigames or super boss battles that gave a chance for the very well done combat system to flex its muscles. There is also a fighting arena, combat simulator, and side tasks to complete in combat, but again these all tied to the combat system. Combat is real time, and again, an evolution of a formula many years in the making. This kind of combat first started in Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII, where inactive attacking and blocking is juggled between switching class roles and building up separate ATB meters to consume on special attacks and actions, Also, the enemy can be strategically staggered for improved damage. This was further refined in Final Fantasy XV, where alongside party members who could also contribute and consume an ATB meter for special attacks, a tactical mode would slow down combat to a crawl while the menu could be selected for more specific moves and strategies, and a summon could be primed when combat became dicey. Here, all of that returns, with the addition of a limit break meter to execute a single strong move, and additional options brought in by equipable gems called Materia. Each of the four playable characters contribute a unique strength to battle, though only three can be fielded at a time. Cloud can switch between a faster, more mobile attacking mode and a higher damage dealing counterattacking stance. Barret has an assortment of ranged damage and support options while being able to build ATB very quickly. Tifa builds a stagger meter the fastest with her quick strikes, and Aerith features strong magic and recovery options. Each member feels and actually is essential to combat, as there are few times when the whole team is together, and the player must learn to master each character and their dynamics across different team-ups. Overall, combat is usually resolved quickly, and the mix of action and strategy is a pleasure, especially against all of the bosses which feature multiple stages that force players to adapt and overcome. While there are no random encounters and enemies are visible on the field, each encounter was something I actually looked forward to. I also appreciate how the game does not stop after combat, and I don't have to manually pick up anything as my rewards, and results quickly enter and exit the screen. It's not without faults though. My major complaint is the camera for combat is simply terrible for the speed and scope of fights. 
Even when setting the option to zoom out to the max, many times the camera does not follow the locked on enemy as it travels off screen, or the camera gets stuck on a nearby wall. Also, and this is very noticeable in hard mode, failing to complete an ability or action because an enemy goes out of its way to strike and interrupt you gets annoying quickly, especially when you give a command to a party member and it gets interrupted, losing precious ATB and MP for it. One time I was even killed while performing a limit break animation. There are also noticeable times when ally AI simply works against you, as they run deliberately to an unsafe position and get downed, stand there and watch you attack while doing nothing but blocking, or rush to start attacking a different opponent than you. If there were any means to improve ally AI, or better yet, give the player a bit more control in setting AI behaviors, I would appreciate that, but the game really expects you to just be switching control between members all the time. As mentioned before, materia is an important part of combat, allowing flexible options to complement however you like to play or use the party members. While the game pace stops every time you need to swap out materia between party members, I like how you really have to think carefully about how to fill your precious few slots with your many options. At some point, nearly all the materia can be useful, but there are clearly some like Magnify, Healing and HP Up or MP Up that are simply always valuable and should always be equipped. I also like how status effects are a viable option, even against many bosses, and proper preparation makes a world of difference to how some of the tougher fights will go. Besides characters, materia and equipment level up to greater effect, unlocking more bonuses and options, and all do so at a satisfyingly regular pace. Weapons all share SP, so you don't feel forced to use what you don't want to, and the unique strengths and skills granted by each weapon means they stay relevant for the entire game. The pacing in this game overall is great. I never once felt I had to stop and grind for experience, skill points, or money. If anything, the economy of this game is surprisingly weak and almost pointless. Outside of buying a new weapon, material, or musical track, I came across all the accessories and armor naturally along the game from chests or stealing from bosses. I also mainly bought items from vending machines that were on sale, and between the many benches of the game that allow you to restore your health for free, I was constantly drowning in money as shops served no purpose. The same goes for the Moogle shop, where I was able to buy almost everything up front, and was disappointed the shop never upgraded its stock regularly, leaving me with a pile of worthless Moogle coins. For story, the pacing is strange. Most times the chapters move at a fairly moderate and deliberate pace. This works when you have character moments that really flesh out their chemistry with each other, but this doesn't work on chapters with dungeons that perhaps feel they are dragging on for too long. For the most part, it's not a problem. The antagonist to Cloud, Sephiroth, is introduced very early, and frequent visions haunt Cloud and the group throughout the game, though the reason why within this game isn't made clear until the very end, but at least it unifies the party in a central way that was lacking this whole time. There are also two times when the game strangely cuts the focus on characters that have not been mentioned, much less named by anyone in the game. While the answer is obvious to anyone with outside knowledge, I have to point out that if the answer to any question or hole in the story is, well, if you played the other game, then you are admitting that this game fundamentally fails to address that hole or question in the context of this game. The last chapter also cheekily introduces a lot of entities and concepts hinted at throughout the game, but only revealed at the last moment, leading to a conclusion that simply stops on a cliffhanger and dropping all of the momentum leading to this moment. It's uncommon but not unheard of for multi-part movies, books, or games to end the first part this way, but it's also not the cleanest method of doing so, as it makes the first chapter automatically weaker against the overall narrative. Cutting things off with a cliffhanger also undermines the game's ability to stand on its own, as side plots remain unresolved, minor characters are set up with no payoff, and lingering mysteries exist to fuel conjecture and misunderstandings. It's disappointing to be proceeding so smoothly and end so roughly. Still, the game, for me, after doing every single side quest and activity I could, clocked in at around 45 hours. When this happens, you unlock Chapter Select, and can now jump to any chapter and play on any difficulty, including the new option, Hard Mode, which prevents any consumable item from being used in or out of combat, while enemies strike harder and bosses have new tricks. I was enjoying myself so much, I immediately went on to beat the game on Hard Mode and complete the new challenges that were exclusive to it, platinuming the game and bringing my total to a hefty 80 hours. So where does that leave the game in the end? Well, it's a visually impressive fantasy based on reality with a plot premise based on rebelling against the world controlling political power. Players visit towns and sections of cities that are meant to be admired from a distance because there is little to no tangible interactivity with the world or NPCs in it. Side quests are superficial and mainly shallow reasons for combat. The main story ends with a final conflict, yet the main story is still incomplete, and so additional supplements are going to be made. However, due to amazing production values, excellent soundtrack, frequent cutscenes and scripted sequences, immersive atmosphere, great character writing and voice acting, fun side activities and engaging combat, most of that is forgiven. For the next Final Fantasy, I'll be here, waiting to applaud because they have further improved this same format,
but I'll applaud harder if they choose to break it and work on their weaknesses after decades of ignoring them. In conclusion, this is a fantastic game, and already one of the best experiences of 2020. I highly recommend picking it up as soon as you can, it's a great ride. And now, here are some tips to help your playthrough. Most of these tips are going to be combat and material related, because really that's the only thing anyone would need help with in this game. Don't ever worry about grinding. After you beat the game, the XP gains are so great, I hit the level 50 cap before the end of chapter 2. Fights go much faster with first strike materia. Have one or two on and enjoy the rewards. If you're getting tossed around on your back more often than you like, then work on your blocking game. Try to learn what actions can be cancelled with a block, and it usually helps to err on the side of caution, and many enemies have extremely short startup times on when they declare using a special move into actually using it. I also heavily recommend equipping the extremely useful steadfast block materia on a few party members, as often you will be blocking and appreciating the damage reduction in ATB gains. For almost every human duel against Cloud, use counter stance with Cloud. I don't just mean the stance that counters in Punisher mode, though it is extremely useful too, but the counter stance ability you can learn from his last weapon in the game, the Twin Stinger. When the enemy is starting to use their physical attack on Cloud, you can pause, select that move if you have an ATB bar, and because the effect is immediate, you can enjoy striking back with a punishing counter. Mastering this makes many of the humanoid bosses significantly easier. For Barret, I highly recommend putting prayer on him and having him use it constantly, especially in hard mode. Barret builds ATB so fast, getting up to 2 bars won't take much time, and having a constant stream of 2000 healing to the entire party saves you so much NP. For Tifa, remember to constantly be applying unbridled strength, and then using her triangle moves on staggered enemies to very quickly increase the stagger percentage. Using Rise and Fall, then Omni Strike, then her ability True Strike gets percentages easily over 250% each time. For Aerith, you will constantly be using her to cast spells, so make sure to be recovering that MP just as quickly with her Soul Drain ability. Use it anytime the enemy is staggered, for when you use it normally, she'll gain 2-5 MP, but against a staggered foe, Soul Drain will get 20-40 MP back per use. Practice against Leviathan and Bahamut is practice against hard mode in general. Enemies quickly aggro who you are controlling, so switch often if you need to have an ability activate without disruption, want to relieve pressure off another party member, or need to build up ATB faster with someone. It's good practice for pacing yourself with MP usage too, as you need to make the most of lower level spells and building up stagger quicker. Understanding when to budget use of barrier materia's mana wall is valuable too. Bosses in hard mode generally dish out more status effects when on normal mode too. When preparing for hard mode, I highly recommend the following materia be prepared. I recommend HP up times 2 on everyone, MP up times 1 or perhaps 2 on everyone, and then max out both elemental materias, 2 prayer materias, barrier, 4 healing materias, and 2 raises. Of course, you're always going to be pairing healing with magnify 95% of the time. Honestly, I find those to be the absolute essential. Make sure to also be grabbing the level 2 limit breaks for everyone from the wall market arena too. Also, the most useful weapon bonuses for hard mode are the ones that grant healing MP usage minus 20% and Reprieve, which allows you to survive fatal damage once, which is extremely clutch. Now for some tips on some of the more troublesome bosses. When sabotaging Airbuster, I recommend getting rid of all the BB shells first, then spend the rest of your key cards on AI cores. M units aren't really that much of a factor, though the game does make you use your first key card on it. Put Elemental Link to Lightning Materia on your armor for the fights against Reno, as it eliminates or reduces all his lightning attacks. Poisoning Hellhouse gets a lot of work done by the way, especially when to start stalling and spamming god mode. Equip Subversion, Poison, and Time Materia for Elagor. He loves to spam Reflect on himself and the party, so handle it with Breach. Poison helps wear him down when he's riding circles all around, and when he's running circles on the ground later in the fight, you can cast Stop on him to wear him down and put pressure on him. Equip headbands for the fight against the failed experiment, as they tend to spam sleep in that fight a lot. Handle Rufus's pet first, and then use Braver on Rufus when he reloads to instantly stagger him. During the later half of the fight against Arsenal, save your limit break with Barret until the absolute final phase when he's about to kill you. You have about 30 seconds to get him before he gets you, and that's when you want to use it. Thank you so much for watching this review, I hope it helped. And if you would like to hear story summaries of all the Final Fantasy games, check out a series I produce called Recapitation. Enjoy, and I'll see you on the next battlefield.